wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi qala rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli good afternoon to all participants uh, first and foremost i would like to say thank you to the organizer uh, especially to uh, asasi and also prof murad for inviting me to present a paper and uh, today my paper will be about propaganda and distortion of world view Uh, preliminary analysis. It seems at, at first glance it doesn't really relate to our team, but actually uh, after we've gone through my presentation, you will see the the depth of this uh, topic that relate to technology, culture, and thoughts. Um, I'm actually currently a final year, final semester Cambridge student, mostly uh, going to be going to be graduating uh, at the end of the year. So this is my outline for my presentation today. I'll be going to for the history, and I will clarify some terms, and uh, talking about some uh, re about reality and the mechanism of propaganda, the effect of propaganda, and uh, one of our way to counter the propaganda using uh, based on Islamic worldview cases. Okay, um, <coughs> one of the earliest uh, propagandists. The one who commit propaganda, I would, I would say, if I've gone through the history of the propaganda if, from few books, would be the Sophists. The Sophists are people who really good in uh, debating, in persuading uh, societies uh, to to argue. You know, they just argue for the sake of argument, not really about disseminating knowledge or others. So it was uh, really. Uh, uh, They were really uh, influential during Aristotle and Plato's time in Greek. And one of the uh, big names is uh, Protagoras, the one who connotes this notion of man is the measure of all things. So they, they are, these are Sophie and the Sophies in Islam. Is they, we call them uh, Sufastaiyah, and these people really against knowledge. I mean, they, they are the one who destroyed the epistemological system that uh, in, in the society. Throughout the in, in history, so these are sophists that Plato and Aristotle were really against, because they are philosophers. Philosophers argue for the sake of knowledge to find truth, but sophists uh, teach people how to argue for 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 uh, material sake eh, to get uh, being paid and some something like that. So the origin of the word propaganda itself is not uh, really new. It was used by the Catholic Church, uh, as we mentioned by Prophet just now, once they. They used to dominate the intellectual uh, environment in Europe. So during one time when they have to face the Protestant, Protestant, uh, Protestantism movement, so the church led by Pope Gregory the 15th uh, formed a task force called Sacra Congregatio di Propaganda Fide, or Sacred Congregation of the Propagation of the Faith. So propaganda itself at first is not really a taboo A word that really resembles a taboo to in the society, but uh, yeah, after World War One, we have been facing a, a kind of taboo when we use the word propaganda because we know Nazis and this totalitarian uh, government like uh, Benito Mussolini and yeah, and the socialists, uh, communists in Russia. So the word has become the meaning of the word has been has been tarnished by the way it has been used by those governments. So in this presentation, I will not be focusing on Orwellian kind of propaganda. Uh, you know, if, if you have read those two novels, is one of the best novels about pro prophetic kind of novel about modern society. One is by Ed, uh, Aldous uh, Huxley, another by George Orwell, 1984. Uh, these two people tries to explain what will happen in the future with different paradigms. Uh, Huxley tried to explain. The problem of uh, Orwell tried to explain the problem of society in totalitarian sense, whereby the government is oppressing the people through various mechanism, you know, uh, state propaganda, a very clear kind of uh, problem like V, the film V for Vendetta. Uh, well, Huxley uh, is in the opposite of uh, Orwell, trying to explain the society in terms of we do not realize that we are in a propaganda state of mind, or we do not realize that our reality is false. So this is Huxleyanian kind of uh, view. Of course, they are fantasies, but the projection that he has made, I think, already um, become a reality today. Also, I'm not going to talk about Nazi's kind of uh, 
propagandists like Joseph Goebbels, the minister of the Ministry of Propaganda, really, they have this Ministry of Propaganda, <laughs> just to disseminate their information about Nazis, you know. But I'm going to talk more about like this fellow named Edward Bernays, the nephew of Sigmund Freud, the one who really revolutionized the word propaganda in society, in business, in politics, uh, by transforming the name into uh, public relation, PR. Or around PR, we use it, no, or around PR. Actually, there are people who do propaganda in the, in the traditional sense. Okay, and also, I'm not going to talk, like I said, about something that very clear cut, like this one, the posters, you know, this is the enemy, the Bible, you know, this is the Bible. You know, the Nazis, they are against religion, you know, the communists. So I'm not going to talk about this, but I'm going to try to explain a little bit about something that really is innocent looking kind of material, like, you know, journal, nature, scientific journal, that propagates, that propagates the idea of modern science, Western science, and say that this is universal in value, something like that. So these are the, uh, the context of my uh, presentation. But before that, I need to clarify some of the terms that I've used to explain the main ideas behind this paper. Uh, to be honest, uh, like Professor Murat, he's been using McLuhan and other, uh, um, other thinkers, but I'm, I'm using uh, Jacques Illou, Illou's uh, definition of propaganda uh, by using these two texts, uh, the technological society, I think it's magnum opus, and uh, propaganda itself. So uh, according to Illou, the word, he tried to define propaganda as union of two very different categories of technique, which yield a new system of human technique. Uh, but we need to be careful when we try to understand ILU because we need to define properly what ILUs understand about technique. Uh, according to ILU, it's what he meant by technique is a totality of methods rationally arrived at and having absolute efficiency for a given stage of development in every field of human activity. The key word here is the rationally arrived and absolute efficiency. For example, if you see uh, the uh, uh, advertisement in the, in the media, normally the time being allocated for them to share what they want to project in the media about one minute or two minutes. So in that limited space and time, how, how can they get their return of money back by propagandizing their products? So this is, this is what uh, I think Bakkeli is trying to say, you know, maximizing the <coughs> time and space of the propaganda uh, ideas that we want to propagate. Okay, so that's the definition. Uh, also, uh, this slide, I think, uh, is Professor uh, Aziza's uh, slide, actually. Uh, so I just Google in, uh, in, the, in the net, and I got this diagram, even though it's not clear. Uh, well, when we try to understand the reality, the word reality itself in, in, in Arabic, that in, in the modern society, we, try, we tend to use waqi'i, aspect, which is limited to factual base, and a physical base of reality. Whereas in Islam, the true meaning of reality is hakika, uh, where it explains more deeper and uh, metaphysical realities that we have. So in this diagram, you can see a physical structure, we have underlying uh, framework, you know, the foundation, you know, the concrete. But in social architecture, we have the underlying framework structure, which is the worldview, the paradigm. There is something really abstract, really you cannot see, but it's there in every human being in particular society. So we're going to talk something about this, not really something that visible, quite invisible. My paper is not really philosophical in nature, uh, it's semi-philosophical, but technical a bit about, uh, about propaganda. So the definition of worldview that I'm used in this paper is based on the definition that uh, our great thinker gave, gave which is the uh, Professor Sekmanji Alatas, that he, what he meant by worldview is, uh, according to the perspective of Islam, is then the vision of reality and truth that appears before our mind's eye, revealing what existence is all about. For it is the world of existence in its totality that Islam is projecting. Thus, by worldview, we must mean Rukyat al-Islam al-Wujud, al wujud So, wujud in Islam consists of physical and metaphysical view of reality and truth, not just physical. So just what I've learned just now about psychology, just now I have, I'm taking I'm taking a psychology class. Yeah, we we try we just learn about nerves, uh, neurons, brains, 
Whereas in, in, the, in the traditional sense, psychology means about soul, the study of soul. If you uh, read Plato's book, Phaedias, it's all about soul. Al-Ghazali, Ibn Sina, Ibn Mishkaweh, Ibn Dhamma, all these great thinkers are talking about soul, not about brain and nerve when they refer to psychology. This is the psychologized version of uh, reality and truth. So distortion that I'm referring to in this paper is a word that comes from the word distalker in Latin, which means twist apart. So this paper will refer mostly to the misrepresentative account of impression of certain perception understanding that governs our worldview which leads to confusion error knowledge. Uh, if I, I think if I may take more time to explain, but I have many slides to elaborate, but I think <laughs> if you are okay with that, I'll, I'll continue with it. <coughs> Because uh, this is just the beginning of this. <laughs> okay, so I think everything is clear for about the definition, so we can go deeper into the discussion. Okay, the mechanism of propaganda. In every presentation I made throughout these two years, in the past two years, I always start with this uh, con this argument that being promoted by Antonio Gramsci, one of the lead, uh, one of the <coughs> leading uh, only that uh, uh, philosopher, Marxist philosopher in Italy. He said that during the he, he was uh, alive during uh, Benito Mussolini's time. He said that the system real strength lies not in the violence of the dominant class, nor in the coercive power of the state apparatus, but rather in the citizens' acceptance of the worldview of those who rule them. So he clearly can see how actually even in totalitarian state kind of situation, not really about the ISA. How cool, blah blah blah, that we can see. You know, not the rules, but really the worldview. That really controls people, not really the law. So, in our modern age, after being colonized for hundreds of years, definitely we have been affected by this change of worldview, which I think if we can trace back, one of the earliest modern science worldview that we made use of is Cartesian worldview, which is a derivation of the concept from philosophy of. René Descartes, Cartesian, right? So, in Cartesian worldview, uh, there's a problem of dualism, the separation of mind and body. They cannot integrate this into two. For example, if you study psychology, you will study about the, as the physical aspect of human being, other than the soul, the spiritual aspect or the metaphysical aspect. Same goes to medical. When you sick, the doctor only tackles the problem of body, physical, without ever considering the aspect of soul. You know, when you depress in America, you eat, you just eat Prozac. You, know, you just take Prozac or antidepressant. Not really about, uh, you know, do you do you read Rukia, you know, Doha. Uh, so, th this is the problem of our uh, modern scientific worldview. Uh, in uh, yeah, Chomsky, Edward Chomsky, Noam Chomsky wrote a beautiful book about called manufacturing consent. Um, and also being already, already being uh, documentarized, uh, he, he stated that uh, in, in, in normal democratic society, 20% of society which consists of political class, professionals, and decision makers will be affected by a necessary illusion in order to dull people's brain, while the remaining 80% of working class of laymen is being affected by a necessary illusion also, but slightly different version, like you know, try to get them busy with other things, sports. That's what happened in America, that really can be seen in our society also. So this kind of situation really is a sort of propaganda itself, but we have not labeled it propaganda. <coughs> so we take them, the situation, the culture, as something tolerable, whereas it's not actually. If we try to analyze deeper. So Chomsky tried to uh, open up our mind, by proposing that we are, we are living in a state of propaganda, even though in a democratic society. Yeah. Also, propaganda, like what Prof. Murat told us now, really can be disseminated through electronic media. And the medium is the message. Uh, the, the, the quote is really nice here. What lies behind us and lies before us are small matters compared to what lies right to our faces. This is what I said. The innocent looking kind of medium or uh, content, but it's actually really a propaganda. After I define the word, you know, rationality and efficiency just now. Okay. The distorted view of beauty. This is how propaganda works in, in media.
Sorry, so I cannot show my video. Too bad. Also, the textbook. Uh, you know, if you learn economics, I've learned economics under Mr. Azahan, TP lecturer. The one that he used before, yeah, remember, I, I didn't know the, the real story of uh, economic capitalism and stuff. So we use capitalist kind of, or neoclassical textbook, which of course they have their own version of thinking, the way they say they promote growth, the way they promote happiness. So nowadays even the economists, the, the, the standard bearer of capitalist magazine, start to question the, the relevancy of uh, modern economic textbook. So this is one of the way they promote propaganda, which is through textbook, look like innocent one, or greenwashing, you know, greenwashing is something like, they said they want to, they are green companies, their business is, do, is green in nature, but they are not. <coughs> company like Shell, Exxon, all the petroleum companies, most of them are really evil in nature. They really lie to them. <laughs> if you read newspapers, advertisement about, you know, green <laughs> stuff, blah. <laughs> Uh, I think it's quite good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've checked with my friends in the NGO, they say Madonna's uh, record is quite acceptable. Uh, okay. So, so, the <laughs> <laughs> so these are the, one of the ways they, they, they greenwash us. Also, semantic manipulation. Uh, you know, you see here, uh, if Israel is being killed, they say innocent being killed. But if the Palestinian being killed, they say casualties of war. Yeah, we do not realize it when we read newspapers or we listen to the news. But those words really play a very major role in conceptualize our understanding of the situation. And also propagandize to the public, you know, to earn public opinion and so, such, such things there. And also, like what Edward Bernie has done before in the 30s, how before that, women has never been smoking, have never been smoking in public. But Edward Bernie, using the uh, semantic, this called uh, torches of freedom, you know? That means the woman, when they smoke, it seems like they are having freedom. Because before that, woman who smoke is like a taboo. So, Edward Bonnet tried to reverse the sentiment by propagandizing this, you know, uh, lucky strike cigarette. And this is what happened currently in our society. Woman smoking is no longer seen as uh, really taboo, you know? Also in classes, if you go to the United States in America or in Britain, you have to fight people like Richard Dawkins in promoting scientific Darwinism in classes, in textbooks. They never allow, actually, never really allow other parts of science to be get involved in this uh, curriculum. So in the US, there are lawsuits involved between the intelligent design, which is actually Bible, creationism kind of science, and also Darwinism. So this is one of the propaganda in class. Okay, so the effects that can be seen, uh, first and foremost, uh, I think uh, psychological crystallization, which means that uh, uh, you see this type of effect furnishes objectives, organizes the traits of an individual's personality into a system, and freezes them into a mold. It also standardizes current ideas, hardens prevailing stereotypes, and furnishes thought patterns in, in all areas, thus codifies social, political, and moral standards. I think this is how propaganda get us stuck, you know, without being, ever being critical to what we've learned, what we see, what we view, what we listen, one of the effects. And secondly, alienation. Alienation is actually originated from Karl Marx, I think, the term alienation in his Das Kapital, uh, talking about, um, you know, you being alienated from your surrounding, the reality that you have, into a small space that you think belongs to you. You feel, in, you feel individu individualized, but actually you have been depersonalized. I try to figure out the terms. Okay? So, but of course, we are not in the, you know, in the black hole or somewhere. We are really having uh, some uh, counter argument against the propaganda. For example, for example, in the United States, we have Howard Zinn, one of the leading intellectuals who wrote a book a history book, a people's history of the United States, just to de-propagandize the, the standard textbook of history in America. Before this, we view Columbus as people who founded America, blah, 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 but we do not, we do not know how he had done terrible things to the Red Indians. Who, you know, they, he killed them, slaughtered them, it's really a genocide. That's why there's no Red Indian in America nowadays. So, but that has not been told correctly in the textbook. 
Also, People's History of Science by Clifford D. Conner. You know, before this, we only view science, science uh, achievement led by certain individuals. Whereas, there are many people who got involved in scientific discovery in diverse. So we have forgotten the layman, the common people who that helped develop the scientific tradition throughout the ages. So these books try to depropagandize the standard uh, text of uh, what we know about uh, like reality and truth. Also, like magazines like Adbuster, they have been running a campaign to change the current method of thinking in economics. Uh, one of those is by questioning the Nobel Prize. Uh, they said Nobel Foundation and the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences are recalling the following Nobel Prizes as we have determined that they were not merited and should never have been awarded. We regret any inconvenience and suffering that granting these prizes may have caused by giving the flawed economic theories propounded by the individuals in question and warranted credibility and influence of public policy. Okay, I'll go through, for example, Milton Friedman. If you study in Chicago, if you send our Malaysian students to Chicago, they will come back here, they will bring certain worldview conception of yeah. economics that belong to Chicago schools. And these Chicago fellas have destroyed Mexico, have destroyed Indonesia, have destroyed Guatemala <laughs> in economics, theory, policy making. So this is the people who've been brought up in normal price winner stuff, and then we glorify them without ever, <coughs> you know, really being critical about what they propose. Also like Robert M. Solo, the one who proposed the theory of economic growth, like what Prof. says is not really. The semantic analysis of sustainable development is not really true in that sense. And some people nowadays, they are proposing zero growth economy or degrowth economy. Kita kena jangan bagi ekonomi ni membangun. Macam mana? Syara? Uh, well, there are. Of course, people are trying to formulate theory about that. So, these are things that Adbuster try to uh, do. Okay, I cannot show the video. Okay, so, what I've seen you know, it, it, in my preliminary view about this problem, we can really defense our set a defense system personally or in societal level. <coughs> well, I think for the Muslims, we really need to revive our tradition, especially our kalam, Islamic philosophy, which has no longer been taught in extensive manner in higher institutions, be it in uh, Islamic schools, perhaps in certain pesantren or pondok, yeah, but in Islamic universities, this thing has not been taught uh, well. So, like what we been told, uh, by uh, pro my professor Alatas, if they really read this book, for Lago Mena to Metastasia of Islam, our scientists, our literary lecturers who want to do research, really research not in contributing to Western science, but to Islamic science in, in, general, in general sense, we need to have a certain conceptual view of uh, science, in Islamic perspective. So we need to settle our philosophy first, our worldview. If not, we're just contributing to Western science. Also, in Islam, we have lexicons, dictionaries that have preserved the semantic meaning of words so that we will not be confused by alien terminologies or foreign influences that constantly invaded us day to day in day to day basis. Also, we need to learn logic in order to detect any erroneous construction of sentences or words that have been put in media so that we can discern whether it's true or not. Based on that, you know, logical understanding that been used by uh, Ibn Sina and some of the great ulama, uh, Ghazali also. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to show the video. So I think uh, that's all uh, from me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you want to know more about my writings or my ideas, you can visit my website here, www.shamiki.com. Thank you very much. I hope this uh, two presentation will be an eye opener for us, not being brainwashed. <laughs> <laughs> By him. <laughs> <laughs> so I